local government and becoming the deputy mayor for Manukau before this government got rid of Manukau and formed the one Auckland city. <laughs> <citizen. laughs> um, um, so that's a little bit about myself, my involvement in politics. I've used it uh, because it was a machine that was there, it was natural coming through the ranks. Um, and, and I believe that for the Pacific community, it becomes really important for us to be part of that particular process going forward, knowing the demographic changes that will take place, that in 20 years' time, it'll be the Pacific Māori population that out will outnumber, and I'm sorry to the rest, that will outnumber the Pālangi population. That's a fact. The, uh, those people who keep track of these know this, but of course the governments have to decide what they do, if they do anything with it. And the point I want to make there is these forums become quite important because we've got to visualise what the future is going to be in order for us to prepare for what the next generation had to achieve. And the next generation had to prepare themselves for those particular uh, roles that lie ahead. So we come to the Pacific Language Petition. Many of you will have signed that, many of you were part of that, so I won't go into the history of the organizers. Suffice to say, close to 7,000 people signed that petition in a very short time, put it up to government, and that came as a result when the Minister um, Tommy decided, and I'll use the, the word that she uses, to pause uh, the development and the production and the promotion of Tupu uh, series uh, and the Fuloma journals, which are journals used for the promotion of Pacific bilingual education. And the community thought that that was unfair, uncalled for. I used other words in the house and in the public, uh, which my colleague here well understands. I thought it was stupid. I thought, and I called and Tolly other uh, challenge her that this was the wrong thing to do. In fact, I even said to her at one point in time, look, if you really want the Pacific boat on board, get on board with this particular issue. But uh, unfortunately she didn't. So, uh, myself, other MPs received it. I tabled it, and I, it was a privilege to be able to table that in Parliament. Unfortunately, to a whole range of factors, uh, the last parliament weren't able to consider that petition. Uh, it was reinstated by this parliament. It is now before the Education and Science Select Committee. However, that committee, which is equal members of government, equal members of the opposition, although they have the chair, which has the casting vote, has not decided what it will do with that particular petition. And so, what Labour has decided to do was to just push this a little bit further and ask the committee, well, I would you consider undertaking an inquiry? An inquiry really, I drafted up the terms of reference, to look at the, whether Pacific bilingual education is beneficial to the well-being of Pacific children. And to consider, in addition to this, uh, what is the evidence out there, what is the role that New Zealand will play in the promotion of languages, what are the case studies out there, and to come up with any legislative uh, and policy avenues that the government of the day could pursue. Uh, those terms of policy, according to the government members on that committee, were too broad. And so they are now, what in the last meeting two weeks ago, what they've decided to do, look, we'll look at it, but we want those terms of reference to be a little bit narrow. Uh, we'll keep uh, the petition on the table for now and not make a decision on that, but they have to go back to their caucus and decide whether they would support that uh, inquiry to the language. And the only reason why that inquiry was put up is my hope that if there was an inquiry, the public then could have their say the teachers, the researchers, all of you who know the evidence about this and present it so that uh, not only myself and those who support this issue, but all other members of parliament could get behind and be supportive of how important this particular issue is. So that's where it is. 
And so when we're back in Parliament in a couple of weeks' time, it's my hope that uh, the government members come back to that committee and say, look, we'll go with the petition and then the door is open for you to have your say. In the meantime, I drafted up a private members bill uh, which will go into the pool of private members bill and my bill will amend the Oaths and Declarations 1957 uh, Act and, and will look to see whether I get support across the House to allow members of Parliament to take the oath or affirmation of office in any other language other than Te Reo Māori or English. And I've done that just because when I first became an MP in 2008, April, I was allowed to take the oath in English in Samoa. Uh, in 2008, when I won the general election, this the government changed and, of course, uh, things changed that you are well aware of. And I had difficulty arguing and getting them to agree to take, to, do, to take my oath in the same manner that I did in April 2008. In the end, they had no choice. I put them on the spot, and so I was able to do the same thing as I did in 2008, do the oath in Samoan and repeat it in English. This time round, the rules had changed when, after this election, I had to have somebody else move in motion, a notice of motion, uh, so that I could repeat the oath in Samoan, which was done. Of course, it was difficult for them to disagree with the notice of motion, <laughs> Uh, all in public. And so I thought, look, I don't, my caucus is supportive that other languages be used. Uh, that my Māori colleagues are supportive. And whilst I haven't asked other MPs as yet, I think that they are, I, I believe that it's nothing, it's not a, a big issue that we can fight over. It's one of those issues, look, why not? Uh, it is a small step. Uh, but I think it's a change in the right direction. And I think allowing MPs to say the oath or the affirmation in any other language sends a very strong signal uh, to the rest of the country that Parliament values the diversity of languages. And I think New Zealand needs to build a shared vision uh, for language learning. And there's no doubt that despite the dominance of English as a world language, the ability to speak another language, or several languages, is increasingly becoming important in a competitive and global uh, economy. And so, to those who say that uh, English is enough of it, need to stop thinking of languages other than English as foreign languages. So, I come to your theme, uh, speak out, speak up, speak loud, speak proud. And I think that just assumes that we all know you've got a voice. Um, and I add speak proud because your president said it. Um, and, and I think that as uh, separate and distinct nations of the Pacific, with our own languages, with our own cultures and protocols, we should be proud. And we should be proud of the fact that we add color, flavor to the, to the aroma of Aotearoa New Zealand. I used to have fun on local council, uh, you know, just putting some of those old buggers to, uh, who had ideas that go back a ways and say to them, you guys have always wanted to assimilate us. Let me say to you, Councillor Bob Witchman, we are assimilating you. Our young men and our young women are marrying your ugly girls. <laughs> color in this land of my <laughs> but I'm only joking, so please don't think um, We do need to find our own voice. We do need to have our voice, and our voice is different. Our voice is distinct. Um, but different doesn't necessarily mean that we are lesser. <coughs> different just means that we see the world in a different way, and I believe the benefits that I've been able to achieve from being bilingual is that my worldview isn't confined to one language. I live in the world of Amatai, the world of Amatai's. I have obligations in that I keep the genealogy. 
that I attend the court cases and I am the defender of my family in terms of maintaining the genealogy, protecting the land assets back home. But I also live a role here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And like Manu, uh, when I go to Samoa, um, even though I go on a regular basis, they see me, oh, here comes that New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes a while for them to become accustomed to, uh, uh, to that role. But in many ways, my thinking when I'm there, I'm thinking I am Samoan, but I'm bringing the richness of Aotearoa learning and living into my decision making there. In the same way, here as a MP for Mangere, the land of the young, beautiful, and gifted, I keep saying that until you know it, uh, you know, my decision making, whilst in the English languages, I bring on board uh, the richness of the other culture of who I am. So I think we do have to find our own voice and we have to identify those issues where that voice becomes most effective. And, and just to give you some examples, I mean, there are many, many issues. And uh, this week, Pat Lamb uh, was attacked and uh, I have to say, I got quite angry and started posting on Facebook saying these kinds of uh, views should die right now. And those people sharing these views ought to be banished in some dark corner of the world and not be seen up again. And it isn't everybody, but there are a few who still feel that they've got to, to release uh, their anger in the manner that they have done. And so we've got to be prepared to condemn that sort of thing. And I do so because I've got a clear vision of where I want New Zealand to go. I do want a New Zealand that is embracing its diversity, that, uh, is, that, that sees the, the, the diversity, whether it be colour, the diversity in languages or culture or religion, but see that as a strength for the country going forward. And so we've got to have a voice there. Charter schools, your president, uh, explained eloquently, and I'm supportive of what uh, the PPTA uh, is saying in terms of that. I think the government, and you'll pardon me, Sam, by uh, doing this, but I've got the opportunity to do so and I'll take it up. <laughs> uh, you know, the government is using Māori and Pacific underachievement as primary motivation to introduce charter schools. But when you look behind it all, uh, they've appointed a business leader, the ACT Party president, businesswoman by the name of Apple, Catherine Isaacs to chair uh, the movement of this. And so then you begin to think, well, what is this really about? Is it about the education or is this really about making profits out of schools? And so you, you've got to ask those questions. Uh, and we know the research shows that the results for charter schools are variable at best across the schools um, and they're inconsistent among specific learner groups and there are serious quality issues uh, around that. But I think if we're going to be looking at role models, uh, why don't we look at the benefits that Māori immersion schools have been able to achieve? But again, in terms of Pacific, we've got to find for ourselves what is going to work for our young people going forward, remembering about the vision that we've got to impart to them uh, based on the vision that helped us or enabled us to be here. And so we've got to look at performance pay. Labor does not support the government's, uh, the national proposal for performance pay. Uh, look, you know, from the bottom of my heart, and I pass this on behalf of the Labor Party, but more from me than anybody else, and that is I acknowledge and thank the teachers for the work that you do day in, day out. Of course, Māori College, you are at the top of my gratitude. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, okay, and then Southern Cross. <laughs> but you have a very difficult task. And you've got to see it in the eyes that many of us see it. These young people have a leadership role to play in the years ahead. And so we need you to help us 
prepare them to take up those leadership roles. Whatever those leadership roles are, 